Sunday after Easter in 2009, a faith community of over a thousand people walked down from St Mary's Catholic Church in South Brisbane to the Trades and Labour Council building just down the road. We had to cross one street, Hope Street. The Christian feast of Easter is a journey of hope, the hope of a new beginning. We provocatively called ourselves St Mary's in Exile. St Mary's was a vital community of Brisbane people who had come to understand over the years that what you do is more important than what you believe. Our mission statement was taken from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the prophet Micah, who said to the people of his day, all that God asks of you is to act justly, to love tenderly and to walk humbly. The story of this community played out, has played out over 30 years. It's a story of breaking down barriers, of inclusion rather than exclusion, of reaching out to people marginalised by race, by gender, by sexual orientation and by social status. For what you do is more important than what you believe. And over the years, as a community, we came to understand that for us, working for justice was not an optional extra, but was the very essence of what it meant to be a Christian community, in fact, a human community. And this emphasis on justice also included emphasis on the injustice happening within the institutional church. And so our Sunday liturgy, our Sunday celebration, slowly accommodated itself to this insistence on justice. So, for example, women became prominent in, the, in leadership. Gay, lesbian and transgender people were welcomed, their commitments honoured and their children baptised. Forgotten Australians, that is people who as children were physically, psychologically or sexually abused in church and state-run institutions, felt at home among us. Priestly vestments were no longer worn. And on most Sundays, we would have among us homeless people. And they required special attention and indeed acceptance by the community. For as you know, many homeless people have a mental illness. And so our, our liturgy, our celebration, could sometimes be quite dramatic, at other times quite traumatic. In other words, the way we celebrated the Mass on Sunday was somewhat different to what you would hope to expect to find in your local Catholic parish. And for this difference, we were reported to the Vatican by ultra-conservative Catholics, whom we call temple police, <laughs> outside of our community, and the Vatican directed the Archbishop of the day to take steps to deal with this wayward community. The Archbishop declared that we were no longer Catholic. In fact, that we had put ourselves outside the Roman Catholic Church by our practices and our beliefs. It was up to us to bring ourselves back into the fold. Unfortunately, the Archbishop refused to come and dialogue with the community. In other words, we had to shape up or ship out. And after weeks of angst, we decided on the latter. And it must be said that it was a community of people who had the courage to stand up to an all-powerful institution, and if I can say so, a very authoritarian institution, 
Not one person did it, a whole community. And they walked away from that all-powerful institution with nothing, with nothing but the promise of a very uncertain future. So three and a half years later, down the road, we're still with the Trades and Labor Council building. Thankfully, and affectionately known as the TLC. <laughs> totally lapsed Catholics. <laughs> more possible, well, not more probably, liberated Catholics. <laughs> totally liberated Catholics. Hopefully, tender, loving Christians, tender, loving people. And I would estimate that we have something in excess of 1,500 people who would identify with St Mary's in exile. It seems to me that most Sundays new people are arriving, not always staying, of course, but people from a wide range of religious backgrounds, Catholics, increasingly disillusioned, with the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church, Christians from other Christian denominations, people from other religions, and a sprinkle of agnostics and atheists. For what you do is more important than what you believe. Just prior to leaving the church, we entered into a treaty through ceremony with local Aboriginal people. They were tr very troubled by our imminent demise because the church and the church grounds and the church community offered them a safe space. We continue to honour that treaty with Aboriginal people in our community, in fact, in leadership in our community. And the hope of partnering with them a sacred dream time space is being actively pursued. Such a venture, a sacred dream time space with the first Australians, would be to recognise the terrible injustice done to Aboriginal people by white missionaries who came to this country and imposed upon a deeply spiritual people a religion totally foreign to them. About 15 years ago, in response to the needs of an inner city parish, the social needs, a not-for-profit organisation called MICA Projects came into being with the financial and practical support of the community. This decision by the community was in step with our mission statement to act justly, to love tenderly and to walk humbly. Today, MICA Projects employs 140 people across a wide range of areas of disadvantage. And from its beginning, it has been led by a remarkable woman, Karen Walsh, who is here today as my guest. Karen and uh, Micah Projects and some other people here in Australia as well, some years ago, brought to Australia from New York an innovative housing, supportive housing project called Common Ground. I noticed that last year a woman here spoke about Common Ground at the TEDx conference. Well, Co well, Common Ground Brisbane opened its doors in July of this year to a mix of low income and formerly homeless tenants, 146 in all. It is permanent and supportive housing. Each unit is self-contained and fully furnished and micro-projects are responsible for the tenant support services. We continue to be embedded with micro-projects in, in the work they do as a community because we, did, we do have come to believe that what you do is more important than what you believe. When it comes to belief, I think, obviously, that's a very personal affair. 
However, speaking for myself personally, there have been a number of paradigm shifts over the years. I have now come to an understanding that no one religion is the same, but that all are equally valid. That the scriptures, the sacred writings of the various religions are works of literature. They are not concerned with history as actual historical happenings. And they are not divinely inspired. They are rather clever and subtle literature, story, paradox, poetry, metaphor, allegory, whose purpose is to guide their adherents, to help them to find direction and order in their lives. In fact, the purpose of all religions is to help their followers to grapple with the most profound questions and experiences that life throws at all of us. What the Australian biblical professor Robert Crotty calls ultimacy. And I think if religions do that, then they fulfil their purpose. Such an understanding of religion, of course, means that there's no place for religious intolerance or bigotry or hatred or one-upmanship. And surely such an understanding of religion is a key to peace among the religions of the world and therefore among the peoples of the world. Of course, you don't have to be religious to know that what you do is more important than what you believe. After all, belief is only a concept. And whether your beliefs are religious or political beliefs or scientific or philosophical, they change as the years go by. And of course, you don't have to be religious to act justly, to love tenderly and to walk humbly. Thank you very much.